All right, Jeremy, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Well, I'm Jeremy Rochelle, uh, Executive Director of Learning Sciences Research at Digital Promise, and I'll explain what Digital Promise is in just a second. Uh, but first, I want to say how exciting it is to have people from all over the world joining in here. I see South Africa and Saudi Arabia, and I don't know where everyone's from, but if you came late and you could put something in the in the chat about where you're coming from, what you're interested in, etc. I would love to know. And I, I hope to keep this pretty interactive. So I'm just going to be presenting for really a short time just to give you some context. But then let's talk about what you want to spend time talking about, what you want to learn more about here. Uh, I think that would make it most, most fun for all of us. Um, so just a few words about where I work, Digital Promise. Digital Promise is a nonprofit organization. It's about 10 years old and mostly works on behalf of K-12 districts and schools. Uh, although I work in the research group, Learning Sciences Research, but the primary threat, Digital Promise is about 150, pe 150 people. Uh, maybe about 30 of those are in research and the rest are all really involved in various um, school facing things. Some of it's higher ed, some of it's workforce too. And the, the premier example is the League of Innovative Schools. And that's something that school districts join. There are about 120 districts in it. Those districts have about 4 million students in to get in together. And the league works together um, to share ways they're improving education. And so for me, it's been fantastic to be here at Digital Promise. It's five years now, because in my prior work as a researcher, and I've been at it for 30 years or more, um, yeah, I worked with teachers sometimes. Um, maybe isolated people who are at a higher level, but I rarely had insight into what school leaders were thinking. And of course, when we think about learning analytics, they're thinking a lot and they hold a lot of the levers to really make changes for their students or to sustain changes. Sometimes you can go into a school, make something cool happen, but the minute you leave, it fades and it fades because you never had the school leader involved. So that's been really an exciting thing for me is to look at things like learning analytics from a district perspective and what, what success looks like to them, what they would need the data to do to help them improve schools. Ah, thank you for putting in the link for me to the League of Innovative Schools, super cool. So what I hope to talk a little bit with you all today um, about is CIRNET, which is an initiative of our US Department of Education, the research arm. Research arm is called the Institute for Education Sciences. And so we are, we're funded by them. This is an initiative of theirs. And it's really to expand the field towards being able to do relevant learning analytics stuff. So let me jump into a couple slides. I have like five or six, maybe, maybe seven slides, and then we'll open it up and take this where, where you wanna take it. Share screen. Go into our presentation mode here. Uh, where, okay, um, where's the presentation button in Google Slides again? How come I can't find it? New slide, move Top slide. right. Top What's right. That? Oh, it's top right. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so here's us, Digital Promise. Here's SeerNet. I'll explain in just a second what SEER stands for because not everyone here is from the US, maybe not everyone knows the Institute for Education Sciences. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, I'm gonna start just with, with this slide here. Why are we bothering at all? Well, I've been a researcher for, like I said, 30 years or so. And a lot of the research that gets done is pretty disconnected from the platforms students are using day in, day out. And when I was a younger researcher, that made a lot of sense there weren't a lot of applications in of technology in schools at large, like in the 1990s. If you wanted something really cool to happen in a school, you pretty much had to walk in with the laptops yourself um, to make it happen. They weren't even necessarily laptops. Um, so it kind of made sense back then that we had this model that we were testing things out in the small, and then someday later we would scale them up. But the world has changed, and especially where we are post-pandemic, technology is being used massively by everyone. 
And you know, does it really make sense for research to be this little bubble over here studying the things it cares about and students over there are, are, are using all these other tools and we're not studying those. So that, that's one big motivation for me is, so one thing I tried to do for a lot of my life is take the things in the small bubble here and move them to the large number of students. But there's now an opportunity to do the other thing, which is take the small number of researchers over here and move the researchers to the students and the data they're doing. And that's part about what this is about. Uh, a second thing you find, if you look at the portfolio of research that government agencies fund, most of those studies have very small numbers of students in them. It says less than a thousand here, but there's many that only have 50 students in the study. And when you only have 50 students, you're leaving out so much variability. And so that's really important because learners aren't the same. So how do we get to bigger data sets is another query here. And the other, third thing is that the research insights that we develop, we have this great idea, it really works. We publish it in the best paper. Uh, all our fellow scholars pat us on the back. How does it get out there? Who uses it? And it happens very slowly. So how can we change those things? Um, well, here's the future on the right-hand side that CIRNET's about is some of its question framing. Could we make sure we're asking research questions that educators want to know the answer to and would be if we knew the answer they'd apply it at scale sometimes we're just asking the wrong questions once we've got the right question is there a way to do the research on a platform that's already being used and so IES the funder said 100,000 or more students instead of having to get to that level by building our own audience of students can we do the research where they are and this is really improvement research that we're interested in. So there are existing platforms out there. That's not to say they're the best they could be. And so is there a way to really take the word platform seriously? The word platform to me, to me means you can build on top of it. So can we take an experience that students are getting now and say, we have a new version that's a potentially better version. And we can embed that in what they're using today and we can collect some data and find out if that's really an improvement. So those are some of the goals of CRNAM. See if there's anything from this older slide that I missed. No, I think I got that. This is the structure of the initiative that I'm part of. We're gonna be, what I do is gonna be in the middle and, but I'll start with the two sides of the thing. The, this funding agency in the US put out a competition a year ago, and they said, we want to fund five platforms that already exist and have 100,000 students to become open to third party researchers. In other words, researchers not at their university, not at their company. And there were five winners of that competition, and these are the five. Uh, I'll briefly say what they are so you have some sense. ASU Online, well, ASU is Arizona State University. And they have uh, an enormous online learning program in higher ed. Um, I think 50,000 or more students a year, maybe 60,000. And tremendous amounts of data about those students, what courses they take and what happens inside the courses. And so to this point, only a few people at ASU could ever look at that data. And so the challenge they're faced with over at ASU is how could we open this up? so that other people could do studies within our online learning platform. OpenStax is probably the world's most popular open textbook series, mostly for higher ed, a little bit high school. Um, and they are, well, you know, textbooks are really important, but they're also a really old experience. And so the kinetic, the thing to the side of the slash there, is the way they're opening up the textbook reading experience to make it more interactive and letting researchers get in there. And in the context of a textbook, uh, say on biology or chemistry, that the student is studying, open up that experience and think of a better way to support learning. Canvas is a very popular LMS, uh, learning management system used very widely in the United States. Some whole states have adopted it. And uh, it basically delivers assignments and lessons and the components of school. Terracotta is a plugin that lets you do some A-B comparisons and randomized trials within Canvas. 
And so that can be pretty cool because you're really dealing in stuff that schools already use in math. So now these next three, these top two are, are higher ed, bottom three K-12. Math is Carnegie Learning, which is long done intelligent tutoring systems and innovative instruction. And Upgrade is their approach to letting people uh, take a curriculum module that Matthew already delivers and think of a way to do that better, improve it, and then test that. And Assistments is an online math problem solving tool, probably the most likely thing that everyone here knows. And eTrials is their framework for letting third parties in. So we've got these five. One quick clarification. We are not trying to make these five talk to each other. These are very different things. And it just, you know, that'd be, that, that's, that's a, a lift of a different level to get these things to talk each other. So we're expecting that most research projects just pick one, the one that's most relevant to them. And so we've been working for a year now as these things make plans for how they're gonna open up and support third-party researchers. Now, traversing over to the right-hand side, IES announced a week or two ago in, in the place one announces these things in the United States, the Federal Register, that they're going to start funding studies. So they want to fund, I believe they said 10 studies and a modest amount of money. And those studies would each write a proposal that says, I'm going to work with one of these platforms and here's what, here's the research question I'm going to answer. Here's the improvement I'm going to test. And they can be any of these kind of studies. So you have on the one hand side platforms and the other hand side third party researchers who are going to apply to use the platforms. And then we're sitting in the middle, middle as Digital Promise trying to connect. So both sides have a more rational connection. You know, one kind of thing we've been doing is these five platforms are really different. And can we just have standardized descriptions of what they are? and what they offer and what the mechanics are of saying you would uh, engage with them. Because otherwise the researchers over here, it's a tough problem for them to discover what's possible about five different things. So that's the kind of thing we're doing in, in the middle um, is trying to make this whole enterprise work. Um, the thing that's super exciting to me is, is these are really cool opportunities in terms of platforms. Um, they're all really good and they all collect a lot of data, much more than 100,000 for all of them, students involved. And so if we could help researchers come to these things and pose really interesting questions or really interesting ideas for improvement, that would be a really cool thing. And so that's what we're working towards with CRNet. Um, and so this will go on for about five years of this business of connecting researchers to platforms and doing studies and us being in the middle. Oh, and it does say down here at the bottom, we wanna bring educators in. Remember I said in the beginning, um, how do we make these studies that happen most relevant to real educational practice? And so digital problems just, we have all these districts, we know a lot about educational practice. And so we're trying to infuse this whole thing with, hey, let's keep in mind. So let me give you a quick example of that before I go on. What would that look like? Like, don't the researchers know the right questions to ask? Obviously they do, obviously. So they just ask the right questions when they're done, they tell the answers and everyone's happy. Well, you know, some of the kinds of things we, we find is researchers will want to study what's the most needed or best way to adapt to every individual kid. And a district leader might be concerned about the structure of the schooling system they lead. And they may say something like, well, I've got some schools that always perform great over here. And I've got some schools over there that have a different set of challenges. You know, are they using this platform in the best way? Are they using it in the same ways? What could I do so they use it in the right ways? What kinds of adaptations are needed specific to this, this, this school that I really want to help? And so they're just, they look at it from an organizational lens, right? They don't, they're, individuals are in there, individuals matter, but their priorities are often organizational. So that's an example of a kind of thing. They often know a lot of specifics about the populations of students they most want to support. And researchers may not be aware uh, of that, of, the district perspective on the needs. And of course, the district leaders always wanna see their teachers in the loop. And so how are the teachers learning? 
how are the teachers, how does this make the teachers feel more supported, more engaged? How do teachers get information about the students? Everyone says dashboards, but I don't see very many dashboards that work. I just have to tell you. Um, so anyway, um, that's some of what we do. Uh, so this is what we're going to do, get people together, engage the researchers, help produce knowledge. The researchers can ask better questions. That's what I was just talking about now. And when this thing is done, well, as, as it really starts generating research, digital promise, my role will be to help synthesize what have we learned. Okay, I want to say just what SEER is briefly, and then we're pretty close to discussion time already. And just to hear what you're thinking and what's exciting about this or not exciting about this to you. Um, so SEER is, um, oh, I should have spelled out what it means, but excellence in research is uh, science, maybe scientific. I don't remember the first letter. Somebody will look it up. Uh, but the funding agency, IES says, this is what good quality studies, these are characteristics of good quality studies. So we should know what the study is in advance so we can track it. Um, open data is a goal for us so that people can review, replicate, dig in deeper, whatever. Now, we actually don't just look at these things as black boxes, but we're thinking about what's inside and what are the pieces when you're making an improvement to one of these things? What are the pieces of the improvement? That you're actually documenting, again, this is a not black box kind of thing. You're documenting how it's being used and what's different. They wanna know about costs, which researchers don't always address. How are you measuring? What, what are you using as an outcome measure to decide your thing is better? And this is a really big one, generalization, because we, a hope is that if we're on, well, I'll give you the, the example of assessments. Neil Heffernan, who leads assessments, has made the commitment that if you can show your way of supporting math problem solving is better than what he's got already, he's gonna make your thing the new best one to beat. And so that would en enable something going from a research study with maybe a couple thousand students to once it's proven to be the best way to go, you know, 500,000 or a million students seeing that. Uh, now, of course, as it goes to scale, you wanna study that, does it keep working? And that's the scaling point. And then finally, a really big deal for us is, is equity. And so, as we're doing these studies and making these improvements, who are we helping? Who are we working on behalf of? And are we making the difference we want to make? So we call ourselves SEERNET because on the two ends, you have platforms opening themselves up. And on this hand, you have researchers answering research questions. And we want to work towards there being a set of principles that are honored as that occurs. I think I'm... Yeah, so here's things I'd love to talk about, and I'll just open it up to uh, questions, comments. Um, you know, one very basic thing is we want to recruit really good studies to come try doing their study on one of these five platforms. And I'm really interested in talking about how do we get people to come over here and try this out? And how do we get them to do a breakthrough study using this, this capability? By the way, these aren't the only five platforms in the universe that are opening themselves up. Uh, Morph that Ryan Baker works with is a notable example. The stuff on edX. There's no claim here that these five are the only five. But each of these five got a $2 million grant to open themselves up. And that's, that's significant. The second one I already talked about, how could this community that's going to grow at least 10 grantees in the next year, at least five platforms, that's a community. How do we do things that matter? How do we work towards equity relevant research? I can say more about that. It's, it's harder than it looks to really address equity in these platforms. And then my final question is, if you go to an IESPI meeting, the people there don't look terribly diverse. So I wanna make sure we're inviting into this community researchers who would increase that diversity and then be able to ask the questions that are equity relevant and that matter to educators. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop there and just open it up. I mean, you might need clarifications or just anything is fair game that you might wanna talk about at this point. Yeah, um, 
This is Quincy Larson here in Dallas, Texas, uh, freecocaine.org. I'm, I'm here with John Davis. Um, yeah, it, first of all, this sounds like an amazing initiative. I 100% uh, think it's amazing that you're uh, you're trying to get more organizations to open up data. Um, our charity has been involved in lots of open data sets. For example, we do like an annual uh, survey. And last year we had about 18,000 respondents. We put oh. the entire data set on GitHub and Kaggle. So um, yeah, that sounds fantastic. I, uh, I'm probably not gonna ask the most educated questions because I'm more of like one of those practitioners in the field and I, I know- No, that's great. Really every, every, question, every question is a good question. Yeah, I, I guess my question would be, uh, obviously uh, Joan and I only recently heard about the, you know, the SeerNet initiative. And uh, so we weren't able to apply, but we are a large organization. We have about 10 million registered users, um, but they're mostly adult learners around the world, uh, in here in the US, in India, in Nigeria, and a lot of other like populous states. And uh, our learners are mostly just self directed using our curriculum. I'm not sure like whether that be relevant at all. It's not like a traditional university, like ASU of course, is like a traditional institution that has yeah. classes and cohorts and all that stuff. With free co camp, it's, it's mostly self-paced. And we do have extensive interactive curricula and then kind of like uh, just-in-time curricula, which I, I can tell you a lot of detail. I don't want to hog the meeting though. Um, but I, I just wanted to say like, is there still, an opportunity to get involved either in you know conducting research using some of the opened up data or potentially providing some data um, yeah. and providing some ways to potentially a b test and try to discover insights that could be more generally applied mm -hmm. absolutely well the um on the one hand the uh, call for proposals for researchers is is still um it hasn't hit the streets yet. It's only been announced in the Federal Register. Uh, proposals are due mid-February, I think February 23rd. So in terms of your team or people at your university um, coming in and doing great research on any of those five platforms, absolutely. And uh, you know, we'd love to have people who have some experience doing this kind of thing with another platform, but say, you know, if I could use assistance, I could really answer this question that I want to answer. So that's on that side. On the more platforms making themselves available side, you know, I, I we needed a year just to get started here, but it's our intention to at least list platforms that are open, to invite them to conferences. So in your case, um, at LAK, which is uh, March 2023, we're going to have some kind of workshop, and that will be open. And so you could, your team could come to the workshop. And because uh, I, I think that there's a specific IES project here, but there's also a movement that, mar that matters to me. And the movement is to realize that getting millions of users is one kind of expertise and doing all the research it requires is another kind of expertise. So assuming these are all just in team, it's not gonna work. So we have to matrix. And so we have to find ways to do that. So one thing I hope CIRNET builds knowledge about is like, what are the options for doing IRB in this area, human subjects review? What are the options for that? What are the, op what are the options for uh, protecting privacy? What are the options? And just creating sets of options that platforms like you could, could choose among as you open yourself up. Because with five, we have a lot of variety. So that was a long answer, but that, that's the kind of, I, I just want to work with whoever buys to pick the story that we ought to really be opening things up and getting more people using a platform that's not their own to do research. Quincy, are you familiar with the LAK conference, LAC? Not yet. Okay, so it's the, <laughs> uh, it's, the it's one of the leading uh, learning analytics conferences and it's gonna be held at UT Arlington just down the road from you here in Dallas, so. Yes, so you should go. Yes, yeah, so definitely, and I'm one of the conference organizers for it. So yes, I definitely think you should come <laughs> and join us. So um, I used to be UT Arlington, but I'm now at a college station. So awesome! Yeah, this may be the one that uh, John and I were discussing the other day. Thanks. Yeah.
Okay, awesome. Someone else want to jump in with a, anything? Clarification, enthusiasm, don't like it, don't understand what I said. It's all good. I know some people sometimes put it on and just record too, so they may not actually be here listening. Yeah, you question in chat too, if that's better. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in yeah being able to find you know other institutions that are that are similar to. Um, I think that's one thing I've been kind of interested in is being able to help other, you know, if find similar types of institutions to be able to, you know, look at the, the, the you know, broader, more, you know, larger scale research opportunities, I think is something that's interesting to me. Like, so if I have an institution that's similar to my type, so I'm, you know, I'm the head of 70,000 R1 tier one at university in Texas right now, but, um, you know, trying to think of, of similar institutions. In terms of the you know kind of learning management systems that we have, with other you know kind of you know tools and, and kinds of students that we serve and that that sort of thing, and I'm always interested in in, in, in being able to see you know what others are doing and, and being able to have some some points of comparison too, because yeah, it's, so much of the stuff is can be contextual, incredibly contextual, right? Based on institutions or programs or departments or those sorts of things, and just being able to you know see some some other institutions and possibly having access to some of that, I think to, you know opens up doors for being able to look at some of these bigger questions that perhaps is just really difficult to to do and just you know, get my context yeah 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 what well, i mean one of the things i i think is a nice opportunity here would be to um develop some some components that might be of broad use uh, you know I'll give you an example of um ways of increasing students feeling of belonging on the platform they're on or in the learning experience they're in and it, it seems to me that if we could figure out ways of um, inviting belonging in a, in a first set of instructional experiences and improve them out, some of those tools, if they're in a platform like a textbook platform or a learning management system platform, it might enable educators elsewhere to say, well, I can start with this. This is a research proven basis and I can customize it to my specific course I'm teaching for example, and that would be a move to making the gap, it's a much bigger gap between research and practice if you're going between a published paper and something you could do in your actual course. It's a smaller gap if you have something that's like a module that was tested and proven to work and it's already in the platform and you're talking about using that module in the next course. And so I, I'd be excited if people um, you know, work on things that could have general usage once they're done and others might just pick up and customize a little bit more and keep running with it with it and there's so many components of the educational experience that are just never tested at all yeah well if, if i can just uh say like free code camp is completely open source we do have our own lms that has interactive coding and math um challenges and yep you know, test to verify mastery and, uh, you know, sort of progression of skills and all those things. And uh, it absolutely could be just like, you could take that off the shelf curriculum, white label it and use it in any institution. There are a few institutions that do that. Um, I mean, in many respects, this open source project might be a good way of like putting a lot of the learnings to use. Um, and making them and simultaneously making them widely available to other programs because I, I do know that people use like Moodle and Canva like there are lots of established LMSs and tools that institutions buy licenses to or um, perhaps they are completely open source and they can just use it but Free Code Camp is genuinely just focused on uh, creating learning resources and the platform is kind of like just a means of delivery because the way we do it is like specific to what we want to do, but we could potentially take a lot of these learnings and create 
kind of an institutional edition or something like that. And we, we do have the software development, you know, experience, like almost everybody on the team is a developer. Most of them are teachers who became developers. So I, I just figured I'd throw that out there. Like there, and also we, we take privacy really seriously, but there may be some way to get longitudinal data out. Um, I guess the main thing would be understanding what, you know, educators at universities are interested in. Yeah. What they, what, how, you know, what are the main questions they have about their learners and how similar the learners are across institutions, potentially across different age demographics. We're primarily focused on adult learners. So um, those are all things that like we're 100% open to experimenting with because everything's open already or, you know, we, we don't really have any secret sauce. Um, we put everything right out there. It's great. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that. I hope that's not taking too much time. But... No, it's cool. Nice to talk to you about it. Absolutely. I think there's, a, there's others like you that have really great things. would love to do this. Um, I'm just going to put our website in, in here and just briefly show it so you know what's there. If any of you want to go uh, deeper, this would be a great place to go. And so this is the searnet.org website. Um, you can find descriptions of all five platforms, and they're in a pretty standard format, like I said. So if you want to know what would be involved um, in doing research on these platforms, this is like at a glance, basically giving you some of that information. And notice that there's a join our interest list. I would love if you would do that, if you want to know more. And, um, you know, uh, we'll let you know when, like, new announcements occur and things like that. Um, and so we have the stuff I went over about some of the goals of the work. We have an office hour series, which is a way to get involved in starting to think before the solicitation comes out, before the request for proposals comes out. And so you can sign up for that and just get a head, get a head start on what's all going on. And then we have, you know, like a blog with different things we're writing about as we, as we do this work papers we've written from time to time will appear here as well. So um, it's not a very complicated website, but I especially would love for people to join the interest list uh, so we can keep you keep you motivated. And I'll just say, I'll just close by saying some of these, um, I'm going to show, uh, jumped on me. Well, let me just do it the hard way and find this again. I want to show that here's one of the things that we've written about. I'm just going to leave you with this image, basically. Here's four goals that we'd really love to have all be true. And this is what I think we find is always a work in progress and, and hard. So the goals are, we want the research we do to be relevant to equity challenges. And we want open science. There's a lot of privacy issues that lie in between the two of those. The more we know about individual students, the more likely it is we can make sure we're addressing equity issues. But on the other hand, the harder it is to open the data set. So I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. ASU Online knows a tremendous amount about those students, where they live, their income levels, all kinds of things. But there's a lot of risks of sharing that much data. So how do we find the right middle ground? How do we protect privacy? That's a big deal. Um, we also want research to become easier to do. And yet you are learning how to interact with somebody else's platform, which isn't that fast or easy. And so how do we make this faster than launching your own thing? Um, and then we want things to be scalable and yet it, it's not that easy always to make things be spelled. Well, for one thing, if you're making a change to try to improve platform number three, let's say, that's risky for the, the organization that, that sponsors platform number three, and they want to make sure it only really scales once we know it's safe and good. So anyway, we, we spent a lot of time bouncing around the circle and thinking about well, if we wanted to do one or two of these things, it would be easy. But doing all four, it turns out, is kind of challenging. 
And we hope by five years are up, when five years are up, we'll have learned a whole lot about how to get this right. So, okay, if it's okay with all of you, I might just end up there with leaving you with that problem, leaving you with a welcome to join our interest list. And always reach out to me. And if you have any questions, happy to chat more. And uh, just uh, glad to have you with us today.